Hello, welcome back to Pray Tell Live. We're at the National Association of Pastoral Musicians in St. Louis, Missouri. And today we have a live panel of truly eminent uh, authorities and experts. They are all legends in their own mind. Yes. <laughs> Soon to be in your minds as well, I'm sure of it. And they are going to give us all the answers on this topic, liturgy and creativity, unity, diversity, and enculturation. Uh, before they begin imparting all of their wisdom, I'd like to introduce each of them briefly. So with us today is Nathan Chase from Texas. Nathan is actually the editor, as you know, the moderator of Pray Tell blog for, for the summer during my sabbatical, and he'll be taking over the blog as well in spring semester. Nathan grew up in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and became Roman Catholic after he finished his undergrad work at Boston College, which is run by some other religious order. And he has a BA in theology and philosophy. He just graduated from St. John's with an MA in liturgical studies and theology systematics. Uh, Nathan sang in my Gregorian chant scola during his time there and did a great job chairing the liturgy committee in the Graduate School of Theology. And he is soon to go to Belgium where he'll be doing further theology graduate studies at the Catholic University in Louvain or Leuven. Uh, also with us is Elliot Capitan, who oversees liturgy and catechumenate ministry for the Diocese of Springfield, Illinois. I believe you've been there for some 25 years. Uh, Elliot is a faculty member for the Diocesan Lay Ministry Formation and Deacon Formation Program and active with the FDLC, the Federation of Diocesan Liturgy Commissions. Kate Cuddy uh, graduated from Drake University and then embarked on a career that included singing radio and television commercials and teaching vocal music at a Catholic high school and recording for many Catholic composers and working for the National Federation for Catholic Youth Ministry. Uh, Kate has served at several parishes and has been a composer of music and she is now in parish ministry in Carroll, Iowa. So welcome to you, Kate. And to my right here is Steve Petronak, whom I know well because uh, he and I served together on the board of, of NPM until his term ended a year ago. Steve is a guitarist, recording artist, composer, arranger, studio musician, and author. He has recorded and produced several collections of music and and a three-volume liturgical guitar instruction series titled Beyond Strumming. <laughs> He's director of music for St. Blaise Catholic Church in Sterling Heights, Michigan. And he is music instructor at Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit and leads the liturgical choir at Marion Catholic High School in Birmingham. So welcome to all of you. And we're talking today about unity, diversity, and enculturation in the liturgy. The liturgy has its own grammar and it needs to have of its body of canon law to create its stability and its ritual character to allow people to join in. But the liturgy has always evolved. How else could we have gotten from the Last Supper to Tridentine High Mass if a lot of people didn't for 1,500 years break the rules or stretch the rules or add in something else? So I want to talk about how that process is underway today. How does the liturgy continue to grow organically and evolve? What sort of creativity is appropriate? What sort of creativity maybe is, is not helpful and is a little bit silly or, or goofy? So that's the question. I'd like to begin by going around and having each of you give us an opening statement on your view of things. What do you think? Does the liturgy need to get more serious or does it need to loosen up? start. <laughs> um, I mean, I definitely think the liturgy needs to loosen up. Um, whenever a liturgy becomes fossilized or stagnant, that's when um, I think that we as a church become fossilized. 
uh, when we can't move forward and we don't, when we don't respond to the modern world. Um, the liturgy has always grown or developed, you know, I, I, organic is a loaded term, but, um, you know, and it's when we freeze the liturgy that we have problems. And I actually think the greatest thing was when we allowed for what it was formerly known as the Zaire rite um, after Vatican II to grow up um, when we allowed for more enculturation. on this panel. What happened? Did you study liturgy at St. Yeah, I guess I did. <laughs> okay. Well, go no, good. I mean, that doesn't mean I'm sympathetic to sort of other missiles, but, you know, okay. I, I do think that uh, enculturation is where we as a church should move. Good. I've been pondering this question uh, since you posed it to me. Uh, being a, on a diocesan staff, it, it takes a very different perspective when, then, when I worked in a parish. Um, I think I want to focus on the issue is not with the liturgy, but with us. And there are some of us who take a very narrow view to what the rubrics and the ritual book give us, um, and I would say narrower than the church understands, when in fact our ritual tradition and our rubrics and our ritual books are very, very, very broad. And there's not enough paying attention to what the rubrics already give us permission to do. Uh, and many times tell us not even to use these words, but to use something that's attending to the people who are in the room. And I'd like to focus more on helping people attend to that part of what the liturgy documents call us to do. Okay, so more room for creativity within which the official framework. Well, I, yes, and, and I would even say if we could get everybody, every priest, every musician, every liturgical minister to use the full expanse of what's there, we wouldn't be having this either or kind of question, I don't think. Well, another 50 years to get this right. Okay. Very good. I want to thank you for that because my re response was going to be yes. Ah. Sybil, uh. yes to both. And I think that that has been shaped for me over a lifetime. Mm -hmm. You talked about um, where you began. I was the Protestant girl who fell in love with my husband, joined the church, and then found myself in what I suspected would not happen, that I would begin mm -hmm. serving it. Mm -hmm. And everything that I've learned in those all too many decades that have followed has shaped how I feel about not just the rubrics, but the rituals and what they mean. And having lived a number of years has made me really tolerant of how big the tent is and how our spiritual needs change on our journey. So maybe 20 years ago, I would have enjoyed the freedoms and the creativity and the ways that they took place in the parishes that I served. And now I'm beginning to have some sympathy for those people who or perhaps don't see the, the joy of a spirited liturgy. They might not describe themselves as that kind of parish or describe their needs as that kind of need. Now I see people and have empathy for them when they say, but I want some quiet time with God. So I really mean what I say when I say yes to both. It's a big tent and in, in culturation and where we are on our journey is important for us as ministers to pay attention to. Uh, I too think that we need to lighten up. We need to open up. Um, my own experience of liturgy uh, is very odd because I have been ministering and worshiping in one community for more than 40 years. And so um, when I think of the question that's been posed, I think, well, absolutely, we grow and move and, um, and there's breath to our work and the liturgy. Um, I too appreciate what you have shared about um, that, we, that the full expanse of what we're allowed and what's been given to us is really, really important for us. I think that pastorally, 
how can we not? Because every community is a bit different from each other mm -hmm. and just by the very nature of who we are as human beings, there needs to be an ebb and a flow. And um, that creativity is just so vital and critical to the worship life of those we serve. So, yeah, I'm, I think we're all right there. <laughs> so we're all in favor of the liturgy being serious, but also lightening up. We're all in favor of creativity. We've spoken about the kind of creativity that the rites and the rubrics allow for. But I want to push us on how much you think we ever need to stretch what's in the books for the sake of enculturation or for the sake of respecting a, a local community. And maybe we could help our listeners to, to get a sense of when that might be appropriate or not. You know, uh, St. John's Abbey, where I come from, with the new general instruction in 2002, we really moved toward following the norms as our starting point, but we weren't 100% about it. And I'll just say, since we broadcasted, it's no secret, we stand for the Eucharistic prayer. And our judgment was that if we were to move toward kneeling, it would not be a good step for our community. It would really contradict our long-standing monastic practice. We also have lay male and female Eucharistic ministers, even though there are plenty of priests there, and the norms do not allow this. The decision was, even though we're moving toward the norms wherever possible and putting back in the genuflections and added back the lavabo and using only licit bread and all of that, it would hurt people to say only priests can distribute. And to change a long-standing practice would be divisive. So our decision is to follow the norms, but, but not always. What do you think? You can maybe give us examples or anecdotes. Are there cases where you don't follow the norms and you think that's what, what the Lord Jesus wants you to do? Nathan looks like he's ready to... Yeah, just speak. before we started uh, that discussion, I just, you know, and I'm going to show my historical liturgy card. Um, I think it's very funny because I think this is a very modern question. Um, before Trent and Vatican II, you know, people didn't follow the rubrics necessarily to the to the absolute letter. You know, um, the liturgy was fluid. Thing, you know, you had local variants of the Roman rite spring up, and so in the Roman rite's history, creativity I think has been a hallmark of the rite. Mm -hmm. Something that we probably have lost with our strict tradition the rubricism, and sort of the codification um, and the printing of liturgical books. So I just want to point that out. And yes, I do think sometimes we need to bend the rules. <laughs> and, and maybe we, uh, we attend to Pius V with the Missal of Trent, um, which I often use to counter the fact that, you know, I was taught as a kid in Yankton, South Dakota, that one of the great things about Catholic Church is that you go to any Catholic church and everybody's doing exactly the same thing at the same time across the world. Well, that's never been true. And if Pius V can give us permission, use this new missal unless you've been doing something different for a long time, I think that's a fairly good principle for us. And the bishops in France did not implement the Tridentine Mass, and then they began implementing local rites all through the 18th and 19th century. So the, the, the history is diverse and not so uniform as we might think. So what we're talking about, I think, in this area of creativity is adaptation. Adaptation from the, um, the perspective of how does this rite speak best in this community at this time. And um, two kind of anecdotal examples of that, coming from both, um, both of them coming from uh, experiences of, of the Triduum. And um, there is a, a community that we are aware of that on Holy Thursday, uh, instead of washing feet, uh, the pastor has decided to polish shoes instead of washing feet. That, to me, that kind of adaptation feels a little bit odd. I don't think it would work in our community, um, but I don't know this person's community. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. um, but I'm not sure that that's an adaptation that is at the spirit or heart of what was meant from that, or could it be? Let's think outside the box. I mean, I, I didn't think that's where you were going to go with that sure. example. Um, hands and other parts of the body yeah. just makes no sense. Sure. But if we're looking at what washing feet meant then, shining somebody's shoes is probably one of the closest things to me right off the top of my head that sure. makes some, may make some sense. Yeah, yeah. The other example is um, there's also another community that I'm aware of that um, not only reserves the, uh, the precious body during the time of Chudum, but also reserves the precious blood. And so that community experiences the blood on Good Friday during that liturgy because they have found a way to reserve it in a very respectful kind of a way. And uh, so th there's yet another adaptation, a little anecdotal adaptation to what's called for rubrically. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. My head went to um, musical and, and ethnic and cultural ways that we judge each other in the way we pray. And I remember um, seeing Father Ray and Leon Roberts and, and being actually at Leon's funeral and witnessing song that had no time limits and finding myself leaning back and allowing the music and it, its form of prayer fill me. And I remember turning to Father Ray years later saying, and that breaks down barriers too. Should we clap? Is that the notion of, of the kind of reverence that our worship deserves? And that answer would change culturally from the African-American gospel tradition to mm -hmm. a Hispanic mm -hmm. community mm -hmm. who, um, whom I've heard Jaime say, we cannot worship being still. Worship is intrinsic to our bodies. And yet we, we can also attend parishes where clapping is not appreciated and not seen as reverent. So we can talk about this in a ton of different ways. How do we... Um, okay, so I'm hearing people here say that you're quite open to, to flexibility and to creativity. And I suppose some would say, yeah, NPM is left-leaning, but I think it's, it, it's deeper than that. And we're talking about the very nature of the liturgy as a living and growing thing. What about the stable nature of ritual that allows people to make it their own because they're not constantly distracted by the whims of one liturgy planner? Uh, I, as a monk, and I suppose our worship is more contemplative than, than most parishes, and that's not better or worse, that's the nature of it, but our office has not one word that's improvised in it. This is the opening verse, it's the nature of the monastic office, these are the psalms, the the litany is written out, it's the Lord's Prayer, then there's the blessing, There, you know, it's no announcements, no advertisements, it's like public radio, it's what draws people to it. Uh, how do we preserve that aspect? Is that a legitimate thing? How, how can ritual truly be owned by people because it's what they expect going into it? And at what point does creativity uh, disturb that for people and not draw them in. I, I'm playing devil's advocate, you understand. You are, and I'm, I'm laughing, smiling, thinking, but that's what liturgy is. We, it, even inside its form, it's messy and motivating, and it, it forces us to think and to pray and to look for guidance. And by the, the, the relative nature of our differences as, as people, we need both. We need a form that can breathe, mm -hmm. that can allow us to respond to, to the word, to liturgy of the word, and we need to be able to allow ourselves to express our joy. Part of liturgy's praise. 
and I do think ritual stability is extremely important. And if, yes. Father Anthony, you want me to show a conservative side, I can do it now. Um, <laughs> Please do. <laughs> I think this is um, perhaps part of the trickiness of the Vatican II reforms, that ritual that people become accustomed to and they've been celebrating since, you know, they were born was totally changed overnight. And I mean, I think, I think everyone here would say for the better, but that um, in some ways we let our creativity and our, you know, uh, run ahead of ritual stability yes. too far. Yes. And I think that's actually part of the problems that we're facing today is I think there is some legitimate complaints by some of the traditionalists that we lost something and, you know, we destabilized something too quickly. So I don't know. The outlines in the rights just help the pe help the person in the sixth pew sort of feel at ease. It doesn't mean we can't make any changes, but I think as ministers we need to attend to the people for whom this liturgy is about. And, it, and if I was the bishop, or if I had a way to control this, anybody who exercises a special ministry would sit in the sixth pew the next time so that they never forget what it means to be a member of the assembly. And then I think we would not have the problem with creativity being my whim, my choice, what I like, what I want, and it would be, what do these f folks in the room need today? Which is what they might not need tomorrow. You know, and it also speaks to that point about life being messy. Life is chaotic for people coming into worship who knows where they're coming from? What are they bringing? What kind of challenge do they have even getting there on time? Uh, being present to that, that uh, worship together, that stability is so, I think, critical to um, providing some predictability in their lives. And so we need, I think, to be careful in our creativity that we don't start getting too far removed too far away because that very sense of predictability is something that will draw people into you into were asking worship. for stories so here's one it happened at a place not in my diocese in an unnamed place when i was a visitor my wife and i were a visitor um, and during the eucharistic prayer i wanted to stand on the pew and say father pick a right and stick with it <laughs> if i could have put the mute button on it would have been the Missal of Trent. But that's not what we were doing. It was the rubrics of the 62 Missal with the words and the outline of the Missal of Vatican Council II. So we got to be careful that we can't, as a minister, do what I like and what I want and say that's because the people like it. Come on. Let's be faithful. Um, I went out the side door so that I would not say anything. Yeah, something we've all had to do more than once, I suspect, as we as travel around. people, we just know too much. Um, yeah. you know, sometimes sure. it's hard to pray. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to pray. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about what, what sort of creativity is appropriate and what isn't, because the culture is bringing in all kinds of forces. So sometimes we see new kinds of adoration of the reserved species coming in, and there's kind of a, a new right that's sort of growing up after communion as we go back to the tabernacle and the presider turns toward the tabernacle, or maybe he genuflects and kneels in adoration. So this is enculturation. I think there are some issues here around what's central. Or, here's the priest saying the way I establish a relationship with people is, good morning everyone and welcome to Mass. Let us begin in the name of the Father, and the, which to me feels like de-ritualization. Others would say, no, this is what enculturation looks like. It's messy, we don't all like it. What do you think? How do, how do you adjudicate such things? Well, let's start with the Constitution and the Sacred Liturgy, number 37 through 42 where it talks about enculturation and what the charge for us was to be. Um, and I remember Ansgar Chapungo at a meeting saying, in this sense, what the church was calling for was to attend to the cultures of the people who are there. So that means every culture gets its own architecture. 
gets its own music. And when there's more than one of those in a place, we have a lot of attending to. Yes. I'm not so sure that enculturation is what one individual likes and wants. I would not use that term to justify it or call it as enculturation. But still, someone has to start it off, you know? The whole community in Paris did not decide our culture wants genuflections in the 12th, 13th, 14th century, but somewhere some priests started genuflecting during the Eucharistic prayer. Yes. So then we need to be open to intelligent conversation among the people with whom we pray and be able to take the person from the sixth pew saying to me, Father, what were you doing? That doesn't make any sense to me because of our past past experience. Can we talk? Mm -hmm. And I would hope that the person would be willing to talk. If they're not, then it's my thing and I don't care what anybody else thinks. And I'm going to turn you Nate. No. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think our deeper need is today? Are there more problems with legalistic rubricism or are there more problems with, with silliness? More problems with the second part? Uh, with, with, with silliness and inappropriate adaptation. I mean, I would definitely say rubricism. Um, I don't think people are terribly si silly when they go to liturgy. Um, and I think it's because we approach rubrics and canon law improperly. Kevin Cecil, mm -hmm. in his, um, sec his chapter on canon law in Ed Foley's edited book on the uh, commentary on the general instruction of the Roman Missal, talks a lot about you know Roman versus Anglo-Saxon ways of approaching the, the rubrics and how um, in true Roman spirit, it's actually the spirit itself of the rubrics and what the rubrics are trying to get at that we follow, not necessarily the rubrics themselves. And so I think we have to re-educate ourselves, you know, not just with the way we approach liturgy, but the way we approach our own government and the way our country is run. I think we have a different view of rules that isn't very helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think oftentimes the rules themselves can become an impediment to true and honest worship. Um, and when, when it gets to the point where it's rules for the sake of the rules, instead of taking into account who and where and what, um, now, now we're limiting people's experience. And um, I think that that's a real dangerous thing. In the, in the institute that I'm teaching this week, one of the things that I said to the folks who are in the room is, let the canon lawyers in your diocese be your friends. Um, when I first came to Springfield, Bishop Ryan, in my first meeting with him, who was a canon lawyer, trained as a canon lawyer, came to our diocese as chancellor from his own place. He said, we are a church of law, but we are a church of dispensation. Remember both elements of that. Sometimes you have to ask permission, sometimes you don't. And you need to know when. Absolutely. So all rubrics are not alike. Mm -hmm. They bear different weights, but we should know what they are. And I, I would think if we're going to do something different, we ought to know what we're asked to do and why we're doing something different and be able to justify it come yeah, up with, was, with reasons why it's important. Yeah, I see heads nodding, so I think we're, we're achieving consensus in broad strokes in what the liturgy is about. So it's been a wonderful conversation. Thanks, all of you, for being, being a part of it. The liturgy is a living and growing thing. May it continue to live and grow in accord with the Spirit of Christ, but above all, may it change us so that we can have the Spirit of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you. Amen. Thank you.